Good. It is truly a joy for Sister Rodenbush and I to be here this weekend and to participate in the pastoral installation at Statesville. And it's the uh, cannolis, is that what you call them? Yeah, I'm allergic to them, big time. Yes. They're beautiful to look at. Anyway, I'm still here, and I'm glad to be here. And thank you for your understanding, and you will be blessed, certainly, with Sister Rodenbush's ministry as well. I could never come to Heaven View United Pentecostal Church for any occasion without mentioning how important your pastor is to the worldwide outreach of the United Pentecostal Church. For so many years, this man has served on the Global Missions Board and I just want you to know, Pastor, that I've watched you consider every project, every issue. He never speaks quickly. He gives it a lot of thought and a lot of prayer. And that is so much appreciated by all of us. And thank you so very, very much. I'm not really happy that he's going to be retiring off of the Global Missions Board some of us just get stuck. This is my 40th year on the missions board. And not only is Pastor Linder slow to speak and exercises a lot of wisdom, but he has been so supportive of the missions program worldwide. Thank you for sharing him with us. Thank you for allowing him to travel and to go and to be a blessing. And thank you for giving and thank you for all you're doing. And I just saw on the announcement board that next Sunday, you're going to renew your faith promise giving. You're going to have some wonderful people here from Canada. And it's going to be a great time. And I want to thank this church. Give yourself a hand for all of your prayers, all of your giving, all that you're doing for the Lord. Brother Linder, you've been a personal friend, and I thank you for that. You're so principled, and I appreciate that so very, 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 very much. Thank you. God bless you. When you have an opportunity to read the book, Sister Rodenbush and I would like for you to know that there's 40 stories not in the book. Uh, we're, not, we're not sure exactly when those other 40 stories might be available, but I did want to share a few things with you this morning about global missions and what has transpired as a result of your prayers, your giving, and your going. Just a little uh, preparation for next weekend. For those of you who may not know, when the United Pentecostal Church was born in 1945, there were 40 missionaries under appointment to 10 countries. There were about 10,000 believers overseas, and it was a, seemed like a very small beginning. But the group of men and women who came together came together for two reasons. They came together to establish doctrinal purity of the new birth and the oneness of God. And they came together to join together to give to missions, to pray for missionaries, and to send missionaries around the world. When you think about 73 years ago, it seemed like a very small beginning. Working just a few missionaries in 10 countries, about 10,000 believers worldwide at that time. And you fast forward a few years and some good men of God came up with some ways of giving and ways of partnering with the missionaries. And in 1969, 1970, the Partners in Missions program was birthed. Faith Promise was birthed. And men and women began to get a real burden to work together locally in the local assemblies, just like you are doing to help spread the gospel around the world. And you had an opportunity to get more personally acquainted with the missionaries that you were supporting. And so that really encouraged people to pray and encouraged people to give. Fast forward to today. The United Pentecostal Church and all levels of appointment 
has almost 1,000 missionaries under appointment. That's a huge increase. In addition to that, there are tens of thousands of licensed ministers all around the world working with our missionaries at every level of appointment in 220 countries and territories of the world. Every day, five or 600 people receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Every day on the average around the world, every day on the average, six or seven and sometimes eight brand new churches are started. This is what working together, you're a part of this, and I thank God that you're a part of that. And give yourself a hand. Thank the Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. During our time in West Africa, the Lord gave us the opportunity and the open doors to establish this wondrous message, this apostolic doctrine in five countries. And we found some men and women in the nation of Ghana where we lived who were really willing to buy into our vision and to buy into our dream. Can I have permission to come down? Thank you. I may have to get permission and help to go up, but I... <laughs> Growing old is not for sissies. I don't know what this young heart and this young mind is doing in this aged body, but it's stuck. So uh, it, it was a, a time of, I'm talking about a time of change, okay? Uh, the director was a good man. The general director of, of, of missions was a good man. He, he had a burden for missions. He, he did missions work in Hawaii. Can you imagine getting a call to Hawaii? Why didn't we get called to, you know, you know, Barbados or Hawaii? <laughs> Not Alaska. It's, I don't do good with cold weather. So anyway, he was a good man. He gave me a phone call. This is my orientation. This is my school of missions, a phone call. He said, Brother Rodenbush. Yes, sir, Brother Volga. Good man. I loved him. He was very helpful. He said, now I want you to go to uh, Accra, to Ghana, and I want you to start a church. I said, well, I'm going to, yes, sir, we're going to start a church. And he said, I want you to grow that church, and after four or five years, have a, put a Ghanaian pastor in charge of that church, and then we'll bring you back home, you and your family, on furlough, and help you raise some money, and you can go back again, and, and I would like for you to go back the second term and start another church. Pick another city, maybe Tema or Kamasi or one of the major cities in Ghana, and start another church. I said, yes, sir, Brother Voga, I promise you we're going to start some churches. And just like this good man, this pastor here, has found some men and women who are willing to obey the Lord and follow your vision, I found some men and women in Ghana who said, Brother Rodenbush, whatever it takes, we're going to work together with you, and we're going to get this apostolic message all around this country, and not only in this country, but in other countries across West Africa. What am I talking about? I'm talking about your prayers being answered. I'm talking about your missions giving, bringing great dividends in the kingdom of God. That's what I'm talking about. So we started working with some of the Ghanaians and baptizing people, and and I, I just want to fast forward. After four years, the Lord helped us to establish in Ghana 48 brand new churches. That's like one church on the average a month. One, one man can't do that. I, one lady can't do that. I had some men and women who, who prayed up, prayed through, and said, we're going we're gonna to give it all. And, 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 and they said, well, we, we, need, we need you to give us some lessons. And so we hadn't been there six months, and we opened a Bible college, and that Bible college is still in, op is still in operation today. And those men and those women were willing to share the burden and share the vision. And we weren't there but about a year and a half, and we sent a missionary to Togo from Ghana. And then after a couple of years, we sent one to Nigeria. And then after three years, we sent one to the Ivory Coast. And today, after 50 years, 50 years? 
No wonder I'm having allergies. 50 years. After 50 years in those five countries today, there's a wonderful, a wonderful list of good men and women who followed us in those countries, and many of them are still there today. But in those five countries today, there's more than 500 churches. There's more than 500,000 believers. God has blessed those men and women with their efforts and their vision and their desire to win the lost. In August, we're going to... Uh, we're going to go back to Ghana for the 50th anniversary. Another reason why we're, we're selling the books. Somebody said you're not asking enough. I think we are. It's a good deal. It's 300 pages. She is so sweet. <laughs> you know, our wives put up with us. My, thank you, Jesus. One of the outreaches to the Ivory Coast, which is a nation in West Africa, just up the coast. Some of you know where Ivory Coast is, Cote d'Ivoire in French. There was a man who had gone from Ghana to the Ivory Coast when he was a young man. He actually had to make a decision to buy his lunch or to pay a little boat fee and ride the boat to Abidjan, the capital city. Well, he went there as a Trinitarian preacher, and he started preaching and working in that country, and he was really trying to win some people and baptize people and pray people through to the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and his name was J.W. Morrison, and uh, after a few years, he came back to Ghana. He had heard that there was a Bible college, an apostolic Bible college in Accra, the capital city, and he had a friend or a relative who had, had no, knew something about that, so he wanted to come. And so the brethren said, well, what should we do? He's a missionary from this other organization over there in the Ivory Coast. What, sh what, what should we do? I said, well, let's let him come. See what happens. So the first week he was there, he, he sat in class, and he had his Bible, and he was making notes. And the second week he was there, he was studying the books, and he was making more notes. And about the third or the fourth week, he, right in the middle of a class, he jumped up and he said, I see it, I see it, I see it. I tell you, it's a wonderful thing when you see it. But it's even greater when you get it. When you get it, not just see it, but you get it. I got it, I got it. Oh, hallelujah. So we went right out and baptized him in Jesus' name. And he said, well, he said, Pastor, I got to go back to the Ivory Coast. And, and I got to go to all those people that I talked to. And I've got to get them baptized. And I've got to get them into the apostolic truth. And so we opened up. We sent him as a missionary from Ghana to the Ivory Coast. And today there are thousands, thousands of believers, hundreds of churches in the Ivory Coast today. Your prayers and your giving makes the difference. After being in West Africa 10 years, a little over 10 years, uh, Brother Sism asked us to come to headquarters. He said, I want you to start Bible colleges all around the world. And I said, okay, I, I need somebody for Ghana. And he allowed me to get the person that I thought would be good for Ghana. And we moved to St. Louis. We were there for 12 years. The AIM program was born. Sister Myers knows all about the AIM program. And there's some people here who did AIM. And there are going to be some more people here that's going to do AIM. Yes. So it's a good thing. I'm, I'm glad the Lord... I was sitting in the airport in Salt Lake City in 1979. I was to meet Paul Price there to talk about it. He, he wanted me to talk about a missionary. And hundreds, hundreds of young men and women were coming in and out of that airport, Salt Lake City. 
all of the ladies, the girls, had on white blouses and black skirts. And the guys had on white shirts, black trousers, and a black tie. And it kind of, I, I kind of got it. Oh, these are the Mormons. These are the Mormon missionaries. So it looked like one of the leaders kind of sat down where I was sitting, and I said, could I, could I talk to you about this? He said, sure. How does this happen? And he said, well, when these boys and girls were born, their parents started a savings account for them to go on a missions trip for the Mormon religion. And he gave me a whole bunch of information about it. I, I don't know if it's like that today, but they were not allowed to call home but twice a year. Call home on Mother's Day and call home at Christmas. And their mode of transportation, everybody knows what their mode of transportation is, don't we? Bicycles. Bicycles. And I just, I got so convicted I couldn't hardly stand it. So here comes Brother Price, and he sits down, and I just, why don't we do something like that? We are so far behind. We need to catch up. We need to evangelize the world. We need to get to these young people and men and women out there doing something. And he was so kind. He said, well, Brother Rodenbush, why don't you do something like that? So I wrote up a whole big program Sister Myers knows all about it. She helped with all of that. Big program, all the policy and procedures and everything. And I presented it, and, and, and don't misunderstand me now. The, the good men of the Global Missions Board, they are very wise. They have a lot of wisdom. They have insight, and they have a pulse on the fellowship. But when I made this huge presentation, I mean, it was it was full-blown, just like it is today. They said, well, that'll kill the program. You're going to destroy the program. We have all of these young people and even some older people getting money from their local churches, and they will just block the giving. I was really discouraged. I was really discouraged. I just thought it was a great thing. So about two weeks later, so they, they didn't pass it. They just said, no, just shelve it, put it on the shelf. So a couple of weeks later, Brother Sism called me into his office, and he said, Brother Odin Bush, <laughs> I want to talk to you about that AIM thing. He said, why don't you call one or two of the board members that were kind of negative about it and see if they would let you maybe just do one or two. Really? Did you ever call somebody and they just really ate your lunch? Oh, there's a few testimonies here, yes. And then they said, you know, I really didn't mean all that. Well, why did you say it if you didn't mean it? <laughs> Come on. So I called them. I called the late Vor Shoemake, the late Wayne Rooks, and the late Carl Stevenson. Would you be willing? Well, Brother, Brother Shoemake said, well, yeah, I think we could, maybe you could do one. And Brother Rooks, he said something, well, maybe, maybe two. And Brother Stevenson from Canada well, he was a transplant from the U.S., but he said, I'll think about it. He was like you. He'd think about it. Think, think about it. Boy, I, I read that right, didn't I? Yes. So I, I, I made, I, I, I said, okay, let me get two. So uh, we got two. One of them was Linda Revelle Portress. And the other one was Jenny Miller. Jenny's still going in and out of China today. And, of course, we know who Sister Poitras is. And 
they were just, they were just a great success. They, uh, it was just awesome what happened. And a few, a few months later, we were in the board meeting, and they just said, well, yeah, we well, need to pass this. Zip, zip, it was passed and went into, the, went into the policy, and it's still there today. And uh, sometime later, after two or three years, Brother Shoemaker said, why didn't we do this sooner? <laughs> Your pastor is dreaming a big dream for this church. And the leadership of this church is dreaming a big dream for this church and for this city. Just get on board and, and just put your heart into it, put your mind into it, put your strength into it, put your money into it, and you will see greater things happening than have already happened. And there's some many really great things happening. During those early days, is it okay I'm just, yes, buy the book. Uh, is that all we got? The others are gone already. Wow, Statesville. <laughs> hmm, good thing. I really believe in North America missions. Amen. When I opened that little work, just me and two other people, they gave me $25. Now, you wouldn't think $25 is very much, in, but in 1960, that's a lot of money. It's not too bad today, really. Yeah. I appreciate everything that North American Missions does in the United States and Canada because out of that resource, we get global missionaries. So we're not in competition. We work together to get this apostolic message worldwide. So in the 12 years, we started 60 training Bible colleges around the world. And today, today there's over 400, over 400 training colleges around the world. It's the answer. It is the answer. One of the uh, joys of uh, working with uh, Harry Sism and Edwin Judd and the Global Missions Board in those days was there were so many opportunities around the world. Right at the time that we came into that office, uh, China began to let visitors come in. And uh, they began to release some people from their prisons. And in the, in the late 1930s and the early 1940s, there was a family by the name of Wheeler that went to China and they took their son David Wheeler with them, Frank Wheeler. And uh, they were able, just in a short period of time, they were able to baptize some folks and to train a few preachers in the apostolic message before the Red Guard came and all of the transition in, in China became a communist nation, Mao Zedong and all of that. And they, of course, they, along with several others, had to spend several months in prison camps and in jails. And they did not receive very good treatment in those days. But there was one of their pastors and preachers that they had won to the Lord and trained and mentored. His name was Lee Keen. And... Brother Lee, he, he realized that people who had Bibles were going to be in a lot of trouble. In fact, there were some people who gave their lives in Red China in those days because they had a Bible or because they tried to have church. And so because he was a pastor and because he had, had a Bible, he was imprisoned in a concentration, and then a later a prison camp. Brother Lee was in prison 20 years. The Wheelers, the Sisms, the Urshans, anybody in leadership had no idea where he was or what was going on. While he was in prison, his wife passed away, and his son passed away. They didn't give him any notice that they had passed away. Three times he told us he was sick unto death, and each time the medical officers and the guards said, look, Mr. Lee, if you'll just 
renounce Christianity and become a member of the Communist Party. We'll get you the treatment you need, and you can leave the jail. So eventually, he got out of prison in 1979 and got word to the late Frank Wheeler and his son, the late David Wheeler. And David Wheeler called Brother Sism. Brother Sism and I were in a conference call with Brother Wheeler. And Brother Wheeler said, I want to go and see if we can meet with him, and I'd like for Brother Rodenbush to go with me. And so we made a trip to Hong Kong and then to Red China. And this is how we would meet him. He, he said, I'll be at a certain restaurant and I'll be at a certain table number and you ask the waitress if you could sit at that certain table number and we would go down and sit at that table and talk with him. I can't imagine what it would be like to be 20 years in a prison and a work camp, never knowing what's going on with your wife or your children. I said to him, Brother Lee, how in the world did you do it? In his broken English, he said, Brother Rodenbush. I saw it coming, so I memorized the Bible. So every time I was sick or every time I was in trouble, which was almost every day, I would just quote the Psalms, the Proverbs, and other scriptures in my mind, and that would keep me sustained one day at a time. Later, we went with Brother Urshan, Brother Sis, and Brother Wheeler, and I, and we ordained him as a United Pentecostal Church minister for the UPCI. This man, when I asked him, Brother Lee, what can we do for you? I mean, I'm, I'm just ready. I, I know there were brethren in the, in, in the U.S. and Canada. They would have bought him a car, certainly a bicycle. They would have built him a house, certainly a new suit of clothes. What do, you, what, would you, what do you want? I mean, come on. What do you want? He said, Brother Rodenbush, please bring me Bibles. Bibles is what I want. That's all, just Bibles. So... Having Bibles at that time in China was still against the law. And you certainly couldn't bring Bibles into China. That was against the law. I'm a lawbreaker. I hope it won't keep me from heaven. So, am I okay? Okay. We would buy uh, cereals, and we'd take the cereal out of the cereal boxes and put the Bibles in the boxes and then close them back up. We'd buy bags of flour and sugar, and we'd take the flour and the sugar out, put Bibles in those bags, and put them in our suitcase and in our carry-on. We were just smuggling, <laughs> breaking the law, to get Bibles to Brother Lee. And we would, we would, we would meet him at uh, friendship stores, which is like a curio shop, friendship store, where, where foreigners could go and, and, and buy trinkets and little souvenirs. And we would, uh... oh, you think so? Okay. I'm going to keep you. <laughs> so, Brother Lee would come in with a bag, and it looked like it had a lot of stuff in it, but it was just paper. 
we'd come in with a bag of Bibles. And he would, he would set his bag down. And we'd walk around the friendship store and kind of look around. Then we'd set our bag down by his bag, our bag of Bibles. And then pretty soon, he'd come back and he'd pick up the bag of Bibles and look around some more and walk out the door. And pretty soon, we'd come back and get that bag was just full of paper. We did that several times. I made 14 trips into Red China in those days. We took hundreds and hundreds of Bibles. One time, Brother and Sister Sism and my wife and I and Brother and Sister Wheeler, and what was the photographer's name? Vince Kelly. He and his wife, Vince Kelly. So we, we're just going to do it big time. We're going to have Bibles in our carry-on bags. We're going to have Bibles in our suitcases. I don't know how many we had, maybe 50 or 70. We had a lot of Bibles. I mean, every time I went in there, we took Bibles. Well, this time, we're on the bus. We're getting ready to go. On the bus tour, you got to do a tour when you go to China. You have to do a tour. And they walk on the wall and all that kind of stuff. So the driver wouldn't move. Come on, we need to go. No. So then pretty soon an officer comes on the bus. Who has Bibles? Brother Sism didn't say anything. Brother Wheeler didn't say anything. Brother Kelly didn't say anything. I wasn't going to say anything. <laughs> he left. Pretty soon he came back. He said, who has Bibles in their suitcase? I was waiting for my leaders. <laughs> Always have an umbrella over you. You always have a leader. <laughs> Follow the leader. <laughs> so pretty soon, my wife's getting pretty nervous. What's going to happen? What's going to happen? What are you going to do? All right, you better tell them. No, they didn't tell him. I'm not going to tell him. So pretty soon he comes, this guy comes back, and he has a piece of paper. Sism, Wheeler, Kelly, Road in Bush. Follow me. Oh, God. So we go into the customs hall, and there's our suitcases opened. And the Bibles, take your suitcase, close it up. And the Bibles will be put in this duffel bag, and you can get it when you leave China. Well, fortunately, we had Bibles in our carry-ons and our handbags, so we were, we, we, were, we were okay. But that really disturbed me so much. So we were there several days, and we left where we were teaching and preaching, and we went back to the customs hall to leave the country and they had told us that the Bibles will be waiting for you after you clear customs and you're getting ready to go on your, on your plane. And so I see this man standing by this duffel bag. And I said to my wife, well, there's the Bibles. Oh, I sure, I sure hate to take them. So I walked up there and he said, here's, here's your, your, your things. I said, yes, I know. And I looked at him in the eye and I said, what happens if we just walk away? He didn't say anything. I said, what if we just leave them with you? Would that be okay? So we walked away and we turned around and saw him carrying the Bibles back into China. Sometimes when you think there's not any way 
God will make a way. You've been so kind to allow me to ramble along. We need to get ready for church. If you haven't got a handkerchief, you better get a handkerchief or a Kleenex for the next session. Okay? Your giving is multiplied time and time again. Your prayers are multiplied time and time again. Your care for the missionaries that come through here and that you're supporting is awesome. Keep it up. We want the next generation, if the Lord tarries is coming, to look back at Heaven View UPC and say they did everything they could to help reach the world with this apostolic message. Thank you for following your, the leadership of your pastor and family, the leadership of this church. I just want to reiterate one more time. This is a good man, and you can trust him. I trust him completely.